Assalamu alaikum and welcome to a very special segment of Coping in Quarantine. My name is Iman Ali and I'm the Policy and Programming Coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Whether you're watching from Pakistan or Pennsylvania, Calgary or California, we here at MPAC are thrilled that you are joining us for an incredibly special webinar. As always, you can find the recorded webinar on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel at MPAC National. Your support is sincerely appreciated and keeps us here super motivated in bringing you the latest updates, initiatives, and projects that impact our community. But today, I'd like to take a moment and ponder on what this phrase really means, our community. For many of us, we think our siblings, parents, neighbors, in fact, for far too many, the reality of some of the most horrendous experiences in this nation have not been a problem in our community. But today, I challenge each of you watching to take an empathetic approach. We are hearing of, pro we are hearing of protests in a variety of cities, speaking against racism and bigotry and police brutality. We are hearing of the gruesome murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and George Floyd and we are seeing a greater push for justice and human security. But I'd like you to ask yourself, what are you doing to help? Justice is not just an issue for those who have been wrongfully killed. It is the issue of our human community. It may not have been your sibling, your parent, your neighbor, but it was someone's. And one day it could be yours if these issues are not confronted as a collective. As always, please make sure to type in any questions that you may have in the comment section if you're watching on Facebook or in the Q&A uh, segment in our Zoom page. Um, so we can share with Ms. Mariam um, in the Q&A portion of our webinar. Um, with that, I'd like to go ahead um, and, and present with my deepest honor, Mariam Ali, to speak with us a bit about what is going on in the Black Lives Matter movement and how each of us has a duty in getting involved and how we all must work to shift the narrative, uh, shift the narrative change. Um, and with that, I'm actually gonna pass the mic over to our president, Salam al to get the to get the conversation started. Thank you, Iman. Thank you so much for leading us on uh, all these important conversations. And we welcome Maryam Ali, who's a social worker and public uh, speaker uh, on so many things. And uh, I remember uh, just a few years ago, you were leading us in the uh, Entertainment Media Awards for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. You, you just, uh, you did a fantastic job and you really enlightened all of us uh, that evening uh, under the lights. Um, and the first time we met, we were just talking before, it was, was 1991. I think you, what, you were, what, you, were you like four years old at that time? Because uh, you haven't, you know, yeah, I mean, you're, you're probably... You're probably like you're probably like Jesus. You you, you started speaking from the cradle, so you have yeah. always been a great speaker. And my mom and dad had the good genes. <laughs> <laughs> Go way back, Salam. Yeah, we do, we do. Well, I guess you know the the first place to start is how, just how are you doing, and um, and what's going on around you. You know, I'm, I'm doing well psychologically. You know, I, I have to give all credit to Islam and Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I really do for having, being able to process life, you know, and, and dealing with it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm hanging in there. I've had to readjust, you know, my job situation, you know, as a public speaker and traveling, that's over. So, I'll have to hit that job market and, you know, just take it in stride. And uh, with all of the, you know, the chaos around the world with so many different crises, the pandemic, as well as, you know, um, civil unrest that's based in a lot of pain and anguish for many, for centuries, dealing with that, that that's something, you know, I'm not surprised in a way, but um, it's just, it's a lot to deal with, but, you know, we, we were made to be resilient and overcome and to understand and to process things. So I'm very grateful for that understanding. And, you know, as you said, this is a century, centuries old problem, maybe as 
you know, we, we say it's actually started with Satan when he yeah. told, he told uh, God that um, I'm better than Adam because I'm made out of fire and he's made out of clay. So that, that is the original sin. Uh, yes. And we've been struggling with that ever since. And Islam lays out, uh, I, I believe, uh, a way of reconciling and resolving and moving forward. But I, I don't feel like Muslims have reached that level uh, no, of, no. Uh, of doing that work. Um, so what's, what's your critique in terms of what's happening in the Muslim community? Well, you know, um, I can't speak for, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to speak for any Muslim individual because there are Muslims that believe in by standing up for justice and inequality and they're doing it the best way they can. Um, in terms of the entire Ummah, you know, we have issues in our own countries, you know, in Muslim led countries, we have corruption there. Um, but overall, I would just say in terms of like you were saying, Iblis, who in the Bible is Lucifer saying I'm better. It's a grave sin, the superiority, the sin of superiority has really ravaged our globe. And right now we're focused on what's going on in America and our country. And as an African-American woman, you know, we have, it's amazing how we have a comprehensive history of activists, whether they're athletes, uh, writers like James Baldwin, Malcolm X, MLK, you know, Nikki Giovanni, Fannie Lou Hamer, Frederick Douglass. I mean, you can go on and on from the beginning of the first abolitionists and we have this comprehensive legacy and history of describing the problem, as well as solutions. And I, I guess what's frustrating for me is that it's largely been ignored with all that information that's out there. Um, I'll give you an example, just on a personal level, I've gotten to, and I think a lot of people, Muslims now, being that Muslims are demonized since 9-11, you get into conversations with folks who do not look like you, and you try to explain your experience, you try to break down what is systemic, you know, racism and discrimination and what, how we live and what we go through, and then the, the discussion unfortunately becomes contentious, and you're, and you know, you're going, I'm trying to explain to you this experience, they're really two Americas, and so just just the debate of it all is, is to me a form of a, sup a supreme thinking that your, your, your um, um, observation of us is, is a valid one and you're not looking at the realities of what we're telling you we go through, right? And so it's been so long and I just think, you know, with um, Ahmaud Arbery, with, with uh, Breonna Taylor, with the lady calling 911 and going into acting mode. She could have gotten an Oscar saying, I'm gonna tell the police that you're attacking me. With all of that and with the police brutality, with the COVID-19 and the disparities in that, it just reached a boiling point to when are you gonna listen? When are you gonna take our word for the environment and the conditions that we're dealing with? And that's what's very frustrating, you know. Um, so it's very understandable what took place globally. And I think people are in solidarity because in some way, shape, or form, folks in other countries are dealing with the same thing, maybe in a different way, un under a different regime, under a different government. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's, um, I, think, I think James Baldwin said, I, I think it was him who said, uh, injustice, um, it, 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 it um, what was the quote, injustice hurts itself, it dooms itself, you know, so in, as long as that's going to go on, we're going to be in this doomed state, you know, and peace cannot be separated from freedom, and certain, the kind of freedom that the higher-ups have, folks are tired of not having that same kind of freedom, you know, so. I don't hear you. Sorry about that. You worked in the mayor's office, uh, in the office of uh, youth development and and uh, gang prevention. Um, tell tell us about you know as as a person who's worked within city hall, how policy and funding uh, are, for lack of a better term, are not sufficient or 
they become the obstacles to reaching resolution yeah, uh, I mean, in, a, in and of themselves. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would hope that, well, there are a couple things I want to say. Um, one thing in terms of when you talk about policy and legislation, hopefully be, from this that we're going through right now globally and in this country that my hope is that we get more involved in the legislative process. You know, we have elected officials that need to be held accountable. And unfortunately, that process is so intimidating to people. Um, I, 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 you know, I hate myself a little bit sometimes because you know, when I go vote, I'm looking at the names and a couple of days before I'm voting, I'm trying to figure out who's who. And so we really need to know, hopefully moving forward, we need to know who the hit, what the histories are of our mayor, of, of our governor, of our, you know, uh, city attorney and prosecutors and wh whomever we're voting in, we should really know what do they stand for? What does their history look like? What have they supported in the past and not supported? You know, what kind of budgets have they put in place? Um, and, and budget speaks volumes to what you value. You know, in so many cities, the police budget is three, four, five times of the entire budget, you know, of anything on the budget. So we really have to be more informed about um, the intricate uh, processes of, 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 of politics. And I, and I, you know, I need to get better at it. I'm studying right now just myself to understand. And, and we also need to disseminate that information to people who find it intimidating. The average person does not have access to the resources or the, the understanding to go find out a history of an elected official, let alone 50 of them on a ballot. So I, I'm hoping that all of the civil rights organizations, although they have their very specific wonderful mission statements, can get together and disseminate this information in a form that's understandable um, and that can inspire and say, we have to practice the rights that we have. You know, African Americans are so used to the Constitution not being upheld. And that's why I think a lot of people have been um, kind of against being involved in the process because something like the 14th Amendment is getting broken every day. And, and, and some would say the Supreme Court of our, of our you know, country has upheld things against the 14th Amendment, you know, like housing redlining, for instance, right? So, in that being said, we also, we have to know who those people are to be able to uphold the laws that are already there, because we've seen laws pass and just they're broken, you know, and they're broken, you know, supported by our government and our own Supreme Court. So, yeah, we have to know who these elect officials are in their histories. My experience at the mayor's office, it was the Office of Gang Reduction and Youth Development. And I will say a great thing about LA in, in terms of working there is the funding for resources for youth who are straddling the fence and possibly going into gangs and who are in gangs and want to get out. It's probably more funding here in LA than any other city, which I, I think, you know, I, that's excellent that, that and hopefully other cities will copy that model in some ways you know so um yeah i mean it's budgets policy legislation it all matters and we definitely have to take those same the same attitude and energy and enthusiasm of protest and say what's the next phase of this and it's getting involved in rooting out um evil you know rooting out racism bias people who are connected with white supremacist groups. I mean, this, you know, wearing a police uniform or running for an office or having a title does not exempt you from having biases. And, and so we have to know who these folks are that we're electing. Yeah, and definitely there's implicit bias within law enforcement, if not overt white nationalism by some members of law enforcement. We've seen that too often, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and, and, and to that, what, where do you think we should go in terms of our relations with law enforcement? Many people are asking MPAC, okay, you guys are about engaging and having a seat at the table, but we don't think you should be at the table with, with uh, LAPD and with law enforcement anymore. We need to take a stand. What do you, you know, again, as, as a person who's seen it from both sides, the community side and inside city hall, how do you think we should approach this problem? I think there are many um, 
the police department was a you know it has multiple doors there are many doors to enter to to address the egregious um practices that we've been seeing there are a lot of good police officers no doubt um but i think one is budget i think definitely reshifting um funds towards resources and folks uh that that can address causes of violence is very important you know police officers are not social workers they're not mental health professionals they're not drug addict uh they're not uh drug rehabilitation counselors and they they you know we're putting all that in their laps and they're dealing with it in a way that you know it's ineffective so um, definitely redirecting budgets. Uh, some police departments, I believe, are so incredibly corrupt that I think Newark, New Jersey actually dismantled their apartment and reformed it again. And I, I just read an article about it. I think I posted on my Facebook page uh, about how reforming that police department from the ground up, I mean, crime went down like by 40%. Um, so in some areas, I think it's just, it's, it's so, there, there's, a, there's a documentary called Stranger Fruit that I think everyone should watch. And it's about the systemic um, racism and discrimination within the police department in, in uh, what, what city was that? Was it Minneapolis? I'm trying to remember what city it was. Anyway, they show the layers of how a police officer can go have all these, uh, get, can get fired for, wrong behavior and then get rehired in another city and then become the police chief. So there's something very um, uh, insidious going on with that. And we definitely need to root it out um, and redirect those funds. There's a, there's a, the Qualified Immunity Act, I think it was established in 1982. They're trying to end that right now. And I just contacted my House of Representative person uh, recently to support that act. And it basically makes cops immune from being sued civilly. They could break the law, kill somebody, murder someone. So they're being insulated from not um, being convicted or, or dealing with consequences. And th this stuff is not, they say it's a broken system. I say it's not broken. I said it was created exactly for a certain purpose and it's working based on the purpose it was created. So we, we have to really peel away at what these policies are really actually about and and you know be a part of be a part of making sure these bills doesn't get don't get passed or we eradicate a lot of them um then then we you know we we come to uh the issue of of culture and i know a lot of focus is is being placed on law enforcement but you know hollywood you know politics um you know, when I turn on the TV and the most liberal uh, news station, uh, you know, is on, I still find usually two or three white guys talking about uh, Muslims, uh, and uh, that it's that cultural bias that I think is is one of the major drivers that we're not getting at yet. Yeah. Yeah, culture is a, a nice, to me, I, I know what you're saying, and you know, what's in the name, and a lot of people look at, I, I tend not to use cultural as much, because I think it's, I, I think that, um, I think it's supremacy. I think it's, I, I think at the, at the end of the day, this country was built on um, violence, um, marginalized folks, people of color were a bill of sale, starting in 1619. And we can't, this country has not, I think the reason why it's so easy for that culture to exist is because this country has not faced the truth and reconciled what really happened here. That's mm -hmm. why the Confederate statues up. You know, if you go to Germany, you have all these kind of markers and statues and things against the Holocaust. When I was a little girl, even, I remember, you know, my family, of course, was in the Nation of Islam first. So I went from, imagine this, a Nation of Islam school to a predominantly white school in second grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I remember, you know, looking at the history books, it was very different from the books at my other school and, and who taught us who we were as a people. And I'm saying, wow, you know, it was such a watered down version of slavery and Jim Crow, but 
all due respect to my Jew, Jewish brothers and sisters, the Holocaust was horrific. But the, 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 the level of depth and, and, and how we humanize, which we should have, that atrocity that they went through went so much further and deep than slavery and Jim Crow. And then we're in America. And I'm going, that's why when Roots came out, everybody was like floored at just the, the detail in that whole experience. So when you don't acknowledge and reconcile and, 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 and what took place here, you're going to have reporters and everyone else downplaying it as well. And the fact that you even do that says our opinions on everything is superior and is supreme. And it's a form of white supremacy. It really is. If I have a conversation with someone and you can't take my word for my experience, you have a, it's, it's supremacy is on a continuum, right? It's like me going into a house. This is what African Americans feel like. And I'm sure, you know, Muslims too feel like this. Going into a house, there are five kids in a house and parents, and I go into the house not knowing any of these people, and I tell them how to run their house. I tell them their kids' personalities based on what they look like. I tell them the way they should interact with their children, everything they should do with no experience of being in that house. And so that, that's where you get that, that culture, you know, and, and, and it's been allowed. And in many ways, you know, I mean, networks, as far as I'm concerned, networks and news, it's all a construct to for, you know, control, social control, racial control, control of the minds. It's all of that. It's not, I don't think this is a coincidence. I don't think it's, you know, an inadvertent, you know, uh, outcome that this is how people are. It's 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 baked in the cake, and so the and so a lot of these journalists, you know, they're just abiding by what their country has instilled in them, how they, how they've been socialized, and none of them, you know, YouTube is a beautiful thing. You could go on YouTube and really learn the history of this country now, from documentaries to activists. You, it's no excuse. Um, so they, a lot of this comes from a lack of education and buying into the fact that there aren't two Americas. Um, you and I were both uh, around in 1992, the civil unrest uh, after the Rodney King beating. Uh, we saw what happened with the police officer that was initially uh, acquitted by a county uh, jury, and then the federal government came in and prosecuted and he was then convicted. Um, but what has changed between 1992 and 2020, if anything? Um, well, nothing has changed in turn. And the, the reason why we had this civil unrest is because nothing has changed really in terms of laws and in poverty and disparities and things of that nature. Um, I think in terms of why the world is the way it is, um, poverty is universal, is universal, um, tyranny and, and authoritarian, you know, regimes, people are suffering in many different ways. And I think the millennials or the younger generations, many of them, many of them do not feel the way some of some racist folks feel, you know, we, racism is still there, but I think, you know, a lot of this younger generation, they, 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 they are studying and understand that God did make everyone equal. Um, and, you know, just, you got to remember all this came about based on police brutality and just seeing death after, after death, after death, after death. And it, and just, like I said, the string of, of, of murders that happened back to back, during a crisis, you know, folks are people who are just doing well, this crisis happened and they're living paycheck to paycheck and now they're like maybe evicted coming up when eviction laws are in. I just think it built up. It just, it was a huge build up. And um, in particular, that video of George Floyd, I mean, how many times are we gonna see something like that? And it's been such a cavalier disregard for murder. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, arguing over the title of Black Lives Matter, you know, we, we tried to do this peacefully, you know, <laughs> I don't condone violence, but Kaepernick is villainized for kneeling, you know, um, Black, Black Lives Matter movement is vi villainized for naming it that. It doesn't say 
It doesn't say only Black Lives Matter, but again, that is not being, and we're in this country, we're not somewhere else, we're dealing with this country. And the structural racism tactics have, for the most part, for the majority in this country, have been against Black people. That's just a fact. If you do your research, you know, with housing, education, you just, it, 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 a lot of those structures have been based on people of color. So to argue over a title, um, you're not facing the truth. But again, like I said before, this is a country that doesn't face the truth. So it's very easy to argue over someone kneeling. Of course, he's not kneeling because he's disrespecting the flag. The flag is an object. But even in that, you're saying a black man, a black woman, you know, is death is just not as valuable as the object that was made that has no, that has no real power. You know, it's, it's, we're not worshiping and praying to the flag. It's not a deity, but uh, a life is, is not as important than, than the flag. And again, he never said, I'm disgracing the flag. That was a narrative that folks came up with to not deal with the issue. And you now know, we, yeah, thought, now we, I felt an earthquake just now. You know, I live by a freeway where the trucks go by. My building <laughs> moves. So, <laughs> Excuse me, my eyes kind of went crazy. Oh, we're good. We're good. We had one last week, so I'm a little on edge. Don't worry. Um, uh, the, um, the the other issue here then is uh, with uh, the movement towards Black Lives Matter. Oh, the NFL, by the way, they, they acknowledged that they made a mistake with Colin Kaepernick. They said oh, we so should have listened. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how so many companies now and the corporate world is trying to make up for all this, this lost time from the past? You know what? It is what it is in that department. I don't celebrate all of that. Really, I want to get to the, the real issue of let's be real about the disparities. Let's be real about, you know, education you know we, we live in a system where it, the feedback loop is you know your house is worth a lot of property tax which is also based on redlining and then that feeds into the educational system the school i used to work out of when i worked for the very first gang prevention program that i was involved in was like a prison yard that school felt like a prison yard and then you know i went to speak at another school out in west out in malibu whatever for some kids and it's just the beautiful accommodations, resources, the counseling office, the swimming pool. And so people are set up to fail. These are manufactured, you know, manufactured urban poverty centers for folk. And the, the reality of those things is why, you know, when people start talking about black on black crime, I think the reason why police brutality is just um, so provocative is that it's a part of that system of structural racism, like those other systems even create the poverty and the death. Mm -hmm. You know, there was not a bailout for cities when African Americans were working, they had their homes, manufacturing was the industry. And when that turned into a service industry, there was no, oh my God, all these people don't have jobs now. Let's put in resource in those communities let's train, let's shift them from manufacturing industry to service industry. That didn't happen. It was, okay, now these cities are poor, manufacturing jobs are gone because of deindustrialization. So now let's just criminalize the behavior because they don't have jobs. War on crime, a war on drugs, not, you know, so I mean, we have to understand the real history of why we've gotten to this point. And, and, and when an NFL lead or a company, you know, says, oh, I'm sorry, this or that, if you're not going to address those other things and understand that history, then you're not saying anything to me. You're, you know, you're just apologizing because the rebellion got close to your house in Beverly Hills. That's right. Got close. So now you're like, oh, whoa, what's going on here? Let's, let's, let's do a statement. You know, but as long as those rebellions were in the hood, it was like they're burning up their own cities. Again, as a Muslim, I don't condone violence. I understand why it's violent. I understand why 
folks are thinking, if I can't be free like you're free, and if I can't be under this constitution the way you are, then none of us are going to be safe. And that's, that's the mentality, you know, not that it's a right mentality, but it, it is what it is. So, I mean, you know, it, water under the bridge, you know, w with that, but we just, we have to address the realities of structure and institutions and, you know, there's a physical, what they call riot, and then there's a silent one. You know, corporate America has rioted us and exploited us for forever. So let's let's get down to brass knuckles and uh, I don't know if that's the right phrasing, but let's really talk about the issues and get involved in changing those issues and, and you know, holding these legislators accountable. And if you're not going to uphold the law, you got to go. You know, whether you're police chief, a mayor, a governor, city attorney, a prosecutor, whoever you are, if you're elected, House of Representatives, we, we need to find out who your elected officials are, find out when their time is up to, you know, vote someone else in. And if their histories speak to them not addressing what is, is, is damaging us and causing this chaos, they have to go. Right. Gotta get them out. I like that point. If you're, if you're not able to defend the the uh, and and promote the equal protection under the law then you're not fit to serve whether you're a police officer or a mayor uh, or any legislator for that matter this department is, is in the criminal justice system is highly incentivized is it's there's an all kind of incentives for locking people up you know and and uh, one of my favorite books the new jim crow by michelle alexander it, it really is the criminal justice system is really it really is a form of creating second class citizenship and it's pervasive in our community and and you know blacks are 10 percent of the population but 40 percent of those incarcerated and there's all kind of a plethora of research that shows the disparities in convictions and crimes and the aggressive policing all of this is out there you know if someone says let's do a study i'm gonna pull my hair out you know yeah. we've studied already we know what it is and yeah. we need to dismantle it I mean, they did the study in 1992, the, the Christopher Commission. Exactly. Led by Warren Christopher. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah. it's on the shelf right now, collecting dust. And there are criminal justice systems in other countries that are just thriving. Folks are, you know, going into jail, coming out with degrees, and they're better citizens. And they're, you know, it's all this idle time. And it's really not, it's really not a, a, a place of rehabilitation. It's a place of, of slavery. It's slave labor. It's uh, incentivized to, to put folks in there and they're coming out, not able, even if they were reformed and said, Oh, I serve my time. They can't get jobs. They can't get housing. Sometimes they can't even get food, um, um, federal food stamps to even eat. They can't get, you know, any of this stuff. And you wonder why, you know, they're going back in jail and in, in, in trying to find ways of, of eating and, and, and taking care of their families. And we haven't even talked about the, the, the they say mo a kid is more likely to come from a broken home and not have a father now than they were back in slavery. And they were selling families off. Mm. You know, more more pe black people have died in the streets in this country than all the wars ever we've ever had in the world all the wars this is a, a huge epidemic it's 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 unreal so that that's why people are just mad they don't care they're they're hopeless and then lord knows i didn't want to bring up trump's name but he he it's been happening before trump but he has definitely i think exacerbated hopelessness and saying okay now our president is a supremacist now our president he, he, he campaigned on that, you know, um, he, he's just compounded all. And he's also um, a, been a catalyst and, and ha have really empowered white supremacy. The cold language and the talk and all that, you're holding up the Bible, like that's condoning, you know, attacking your own citizens with the military. I mean, he's just pathetic, you know, and... Um, so I think just definitely he has raised the, raised up the ante and made folks feel like very hopeless um, about our situation based on how he's even handled everything. So you're dealing with 
trying to survive this COVID-19, not having masks, not having tests, looking at a government who really doesn't seem to care about the, your health as an individual or as a society. And then, then that same person is, I'm gonna just say it, he is a racist, he is. You know, and so, so I mean, you have all these things converging together and, and there's just an explosion happened. Well, um, you know, your, your father grew up in a tough town, right? Louisville? Yeah, I mean, they were all tough towns in 1942. <laughs> yeah, especially, especially places like... Black people. Yeah. I yeah. Guess all... I'm saying, yeah, I know what you meant, but... So, um, what, what, what do you think he would say at this time? What, what, what would be his guidance to you? I think my dad, the way, his, the way he processed things, and I can only predict his reaction is, I think he would say a lot of things I've already said. You know, I'm, I'm a child, I'm his child. He taught me, you know, he inspired me and educated me on things. Um, but I think he would, I think he would definitely deduce everything to, okay, we have to get rid of racist people who are governing us. They have to go, you know. Even even uh, even MLK's um, speech changed a little bit. He, you know, right before he died, when he was putting together the Poor People's Campaign, he said, "Okay, we have this the Civil Rights Acts and this and that, but we need more." I he really felt like I don't think we're going to solve this problem unless we really govern at a moral standard where you actually think we're all equal and you actually give equal access to opportunity jobs. Um, it's economic, uh, uh, economic justice. And so he even knew we have to have economic justice. We have to dismantle the structures of racism and discrimination in this country and be honest about it. Just really be honest. And personally, I think that's really why he was assassinated. That's my theory. That Poor People's Campaign was about to to do something completely different. And it was about to bring together all races who are poor, not just African-Americans. Um, so I think my father would look at why doesn't, why don't the, you know, I could hear him now talking. We had these laws and we have these activists and we're speaking up and the laws aren't working. Why aren't the laws working? And he would always like to talk to experts in fields to educate him about what he didn't understand. And if, if he, if someone told him, well, they're not upholding the laws, Ali, they, they are, they're not upholding them. They're just, they're making excuses. Well, we have to get rid of those people. And I, I really believe he would say that at this point, if he were, didn't have Parkinson's, was still living, had energy, could speak, I think he would come to that conclusion that we have to put other leaders in place who actually care about people like the way a lot of Congress folks who never decided to run ran and they won, right? right. Uh, because people said, okay, they're really about the people. So it's not like we have it, you know, the beautiful, I think what's great about Donald Trump is he put a, he put a spotlight on the problem in a way where people start dissecting the problem and he empowered and had so many people come from under their rock of racism thinking, yeah. oh, race is openly now that you, you have, Folks who are not, who didn't experience racism saying, oh, my black friends always told me this was there, but I didn't believe them. So, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, Trump did, I think that's the, the beauty of Donald Trump is that we had to have someone that this, this racist society created to be in a leader position to understand what we really need to do now. And I don't know if that would have happened if Hillary, Hillary Clinton was president. I don't know if it would have gotten to that point where people would want to really try to find solutions to problems that were there before Donald Trump. So thank you, Donald. Now we know the jig is up. <laughs> I'm get you out. And I'm gonna want to be like you out. <laughs> well, you, you carry your father's spirit really well and uh, with grace, uh, like like he did. And uh, and I agree. We we need to keep marching with all the protests. We have to march all the way to November seventh. Yeah, we have, we have to stay engaged. You know, you vote, and again, voting is, you know, we have to know who they are. We have to know, you know, 
that's what I'm trying to work on. Like, what are the histories of these people and how do we get that information to the average person who's not going to do that kind of due diligence to find out who people are and be engaged throughout once we hire, once we elect them, how do you find out what bills are in Congress and your local and national? How do you know? How do you keep in tune with that? You know, we, I am, I'm, I'm learning. So my, just personally, I'm just, you know, this time next year, this, this time next year, I want to be in, in much more educated on how to be engaged and stay involved more than what I have been. I vote all the time, um, but I, I just need to understand this process because it's a process for us to understand. And uh, in many ways, it's, it's, it's intimidating on purpose for us not to pay attention to it. But we have to, the next phase of this is um, flood, flood um, these, these different structures in the, in, in the political system, just like we're flooding the streets in protest. Right. That's the next phase. Well, great, great to have this conversation with you. I'm going to pass it back to Iman, and I think there's some questions from the audience uh, that um, they would okay. like it to answer. Okay. So yeah, thank you. So it's it's been so insightful um, listening to you talk, Mariam. Um, we're so again thrilled to have you on. But I'll jump right into the question. So um, last week we actually had Marguerite Hill from Muslim Arc speak on our webinar, and she spoke a bit about the internalized racism that she's experienced as um, a woman of color, a Muslim woman of color. Um, and and I wanted to ask, you know, the Prophet he said that all of God's creations are cre uh, created equally, like the, the teeth of the comb, right? Even, just all equal. Yet we are seeing more and more that even within our masjid, even within our ummah, there is sometimes this, this um, superiority complex. It's not just an out there issue. It's sometimes even found in our community. And I was wondering if you don't mind to speak about um, if you yourself have ever experienced anything like this, um, and what advice you have for you know leaders in our communities to curb this kind of issue? Yeah, I mean you know um, racism and bias and you know the whole caste system concept all around the world. Folks who look different, have different hair, darker skin tones, have been. Um, looked at as inferior. So this is something, a phenomenon that happens everywhere. I definitely experienced uh, Muslim communities who are not African-American to look down on me and black people have experienced that. I think, I think it's gotten better, um, but it's definitely there. And uh, it's not Islamic at all. And, I, and, and we can only, you know, with Muslims, the best, the best tool is the Holy Quran and uh, the son of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, that's the best tool. And so if we educate ourselves, we use those tools that we know, um, because as Muslims, yes, we're going, we fight for injustice, but at the end of the day, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he encompasses all justice. And, and whatever happens, there will be justice. And, and after that justice is uh, implement it, you have your eternal existence, which is bigger than anything we're talking about here today. You know, we're talking about this situation here, but for Muslims, what the bigger issue is, will you be ready, will your spirit be ready to meet uh, our creator, right? So when, when you're dealing with uh, that kind of bias and injustice within the community, you have to, you know, there's been times where I'll deal with, I'll say, assalamu alaikum, and you know, it happened a couple years ago and these two couples, they were young Muslim couple, they weren't African-American and they didn't even give me the re re greetings back. And then you wonder sometimes, do I not say anything or do I say, hey, you know, do I, you know, so, I mean, it's, it depends, but if we're able to educate one another through the religion we all claim to love and hold dear, we have to identify those hadith and, and those uh, uh, ayahs that, speak to that and, and speak to each other through the lens of Islam. So it's all about educating one another and smiling and, and because hatred is um, a lack of understanding. And, you know, 
just because we're Muslim and that's our label does not mean that we're not going to be racist. You know, Muslims aren't perfect. Just because you say you're Muslim doesn't make you a perfect human being. But, but in educating between us within the Ummah, we have to use our, our faith, you know, because the Quran is a miracle and it, it answers all questions. So that's what we, we, but we have to understand our book to be able to use it to diffuse that, that, that situation, you know, those, those racial, those racist or biased experiences that we have. Absolutely. And I, I know that Salam touched base on this a little bit earlier, but I myself am a Kentucky girl. So I, I have to ask this question um, in that, you know, he mentioned earlier that your father grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and we are seeing this city um, quite a bit on the news lately with Breonna Taylor's murder. Um, and, you know, I think that there is absolutely a narrative for what life is like as a POC in the United States, but I think that there is a deeper narrative that we often overlook, and that's being a woman POC um, in, in the United States, and, and how different our experiences can be um, in feeling safe, feeling secure, feeling successful. Um, you know, with, with Brianna's passing, I, I want you to share with us some, some insight, some wisdom, a message maybe for, for women of color in the United States on how it is, you know, that we move forward in these times where it can be scary to even go outside. Let, let, I'll just say the, Racism and discrimination and what happened to Breonna Taylor, that, that happened to many people, not to devalue what that, that, that happened. It went viral. People who commit the murder and people who commit the assault and the harassment, they have, I, I say again, educate yourself because the victim is just living their life, right? There was nothing Brianna could do sleeping in her bed. She sleep in her bed. Black folk in general know how to survive. I work with young kids who just going to school, what they wear, how they talk, what route they take to the school, where they go on the weekend, what but it's all about survival. So we know how to survive in general. It's those who commit the atrocities and the egregious behavior and the murder, those are the folk that need to educate themselves and the people who've been complicitly silent. I, you know, we, a lot of black folks are laughing and crying at the same time because it took a viral situation for people to ask us these questions. And when other Breonna Taylors were dead, Nobody was asking us these questions because their lives did not matter. It, so what, what's a little, dis, I mean, the viral and the, 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 the rebellion that happened, the social unrest that happened, we love the solidarity. But it's for those who've been silent and those who commit the murder and those who, to do your job. If you've been silent and just start caring about this, that's your problem. This is making it our problem. So all I can say to answer your question in terms of African-American women is do what I'm doing right now. Educate when people are willing to listen. I thank you all for being willing to listen. And we have to use this opportunity of all of this broad engagement of wanting us to speak because it's like the first time people are really listening, which is a beautiful thing. So I would say to young black women and women of color, they're folks that aren't African American and look, there's some Indians that look as dark as we dark, darker than me, that might deal with things, right? Just based on how they look. So everyone should educate anyone they come into contact with. Even if you, you know, just having the dialogue, having the discussion, but in order to really have substantive conversation, you have to know something about your history too, right? So we need to, as a people, learn our history. And like I said, we have internet now that can give you crash courses and things, right? And get off of Netflix for a minute, unless it's a documentary that's educating you, 
and learn the history of this country so when you interface with people, wherever they may be, in Central Park, bird watching, right? <laughs> wherever they may be, you can educate folks. And so we, we can educate, but, but it's not, it's, it's every citizen's duty who's been silent and now all of a sudden they're writing songs about it. They're, you know, all that's beautiful. They're doing their post about it. That's beautiful. But what are you going to do? You know, are you discriminating against someone at work? What are the work policies like? Are you in any kind of position of power to make sure that bias is not happening in your own individual circle? That's what I want to hear about. I want to hear what are you doing, right? In, in addition to your post book post and the songs you're creating and kumbaya events, tell me what you're doing to eradicate what's around you. Even if it's, I have a couple of racist friends and I'm gonna call them on the phone right now and I'm gonna learn some things, and I'm gonna have a conversation or have a Zoom discussion, right? So yeah, that's my answer to that. <laughs> and you know, I think that um, it, it's very well said, you know, Oftentimes, it's not the people of color who are ever in, in, the, in the wrong or doing anything, anything problematic. Brianna, again, was sleeping. So I appreciate you for, for bringing that up. But I, I, I want to go on this notion of what you said of, of educating, uh, educating other people. And I know that you did some great work as the regional manager for the mayor's office in gang reduction and youth development in the city of LA. And one of the questions that we received is that, what advice do you have for individuals trying to work within LA city structures? And do you have any specific ideas about collective, collective action concerning civil and human rights within the LA city government? I think I addressed that already in a way in terms of first as an individual understanding where your place is in the legislative process. We do have a place you know, we can go to hearings, we can get involved in our neighborhood councils, we can, you know, know who your representatives are. Um, I mean, we have to educate ourselves. So like I said, hopefully there's a, a major movement to make that easier to do. Um, but yeah, you, you gotta, you know, find a person who's involved and learn from them, shadow them. You have to get involved with your city, you know? Um, I, I kind of went over that already. I think I, think I kind of, talked about that already. Well, now, you know, we've been in our quarantine phase for a couple of months now, and some of us have more time, you know, to pick up a book or to watch something great on Netflix. Is there anything that you recommend in this time to educate our audience? Where did you ask? Um, <laughs> I would say there's a documentary called Stranger Fruit. I think that's very important. It shows that people talk about systemic racism and structural racism and you could see how law enforcement how they're able to get away with committing murders and the people they're hiring and they're appointing to be chief of police and just the whole disinformation process so stranger fruit is an excellent one um there's another documentary on um youtube called um jim crow in the north and it's, uh, you know, actually it's, it's talks about Minneapolis where George Floyd, you know, was murdered and, and uh, the, the structural racial, racism there based on the housing, housing redlining and, you know, housing is connected to wealth and how, or how even the lack of housing and owning, having home, home ownership where the Supreme Court actually upheld the law um, that allowed, I, ha I had this written down somewhere, it allowed for them to have deeds, house deeds saying that you could only sell to a white person. And this is against the 14th Amendment. And uh, it was upheld by the Supreme Court. So just that alone, the housing connected to a lack of jobs and manufacturing urban poverty areas in a lack of uh, equal schools and there's so much even connected to home ownership. Uh, a lack of being able to have wealth you could hand down to your family and inheritance because the property values are so low because they've labeled 
black areas or certain areas, you know, as hazarded areas to make loans to. And this is at a time where there was no proof that black people would default on their loans. But anyway, that documentary, and it's a lot of research in it, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, you know, a Hollywood entertainment film. You have to really look at it and, and see the research there, but you can, and, and this structure had become this, structural racism structure and housing have become best practices for the entire country, right? It's not just a Minneapolis thing. It's still happening today. So that uh, Jim Crow in the North is an excellent documentary. You should read books by some of our contemporary activists like Mark Lamont Hill's Nobody, Alec, uh, The Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, that book. If you don't like to read, get it on audio. It talks about why the criminal justice system is the way it is and why it was made and how it's just a different version of creating second class citizenship. And it goes through an historical, factual, chronological, chrono, chronological history of ju doing just that and, and the plea bargaining and, and uh, prosecutors working with public defenders to plea bargain and put people in jail and you know, why they're not able to be affect, you know, citizens, citizens that can be productive when they get out. It's an amazing book. Um, another book, I would say, uh, True Justice by Brian Stevenson. So you could just look up these books, get them on audio, watch documentaries, but it's really time to educate yourself, folks, because one beautiful thing we do have in this country is a comprehensive documentation of people trying to define the problem. And, and also have solutions based on what the problem is. The only way you're gonna know how to solve problems is to see what is what what created it so we can dismantle that, you know? And so we have to educate ourselves and African-Americans as well, all of us have to educate ourselves. Most of the kids I work with don't know this, this information. That's why the solution is burn, 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 burn it down because they don't know the information to say, oh, burning it down is not gonna help us. It, we might get some attention temporarily, but we have to do something different. We have to burn down the, the structures um, from, a, um, from a concept point of view, not, not the physical structure. We have to eradicate the, this, these laws and get biased, racist people out who've been trained to hate people who don't look like them and have been trained that, you know, you're inferior based on your race and where you come from. And again, as Muslims, we know that's Iblis, you know, <laughs> the fallen jinn. In, in, in Christianity, he's the fallen angel. In Islam, he's the fallen jinn. He, he, he told God, what are you doing? I'm better, I'm better, I'm better than, I'm better than, you know, humans, you know? So this is, this is something that is going to create a lot of, chaos and death it already has and but we do have to in terms of solution we have to educate ourselves we have a we have a steep history here in this country and it's, it's time to and i'm still learning you know i'm still i'm constantly always looking at something else getting a different book to try to understand better myself because as muhammad ali's daughter people want me to do these type of interviews and i need the, this platform that i have i need to be able to say the, in the best way possible what the issues are and what potential solutions are. That's my responsibility, you know, so. And, and we thank you so much for upholding that responsibility. You know, you said you're still learning. If you're still learning, I think I was just handed the book. You know, you are yeah. an amazing, amazing individual. And, you know, I, I, aside from being the daughter of Muhammad Ali, which is, you know, that was, you were born with that achie achievement, quote unquote, your own personal achievements have been so moving in our, in our California communities and our Muslim communities. You know, your work as a social worker is, is most certainly paying it forward to some of the most vulnerable communities and people in our nation. And, and I want to thank you from the bottom of MPAC's heart for joining us today and speaking about these and, and keeping us accountable, you know. Um, one of my colleagues uh, mentioned earlier today that Lori, wonderful, wonderful Lori, mentioned that um, Netflix now even has a Black Lives Matter portion where they are 
just putting so many documentaries up and so much um, media up that really helps educate. And I think that that is the crux of the issue, that we really need to open our books, open our eyes, open our mind to recognizing that this isn't something that started yesterday. This has been around for generations and will be around for generations until we each play our part. Um, and I want to thank you for playing your part every day and, and especially today and joining us. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure. I know that you said you're traveling soon, so absolutely safe travels to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. When you come back, we're going to have you preach at the Islamic Center. Ah, Lord have mercy. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You're going to come. Inshallah, inshallah. Um, and so thank you again, Mariam, for joining us. And for all of our viewers watching, thank you so, so much, as always, for joining us. Um, you can catch this. Up. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I love it. Said, be safe and thank, like I said, thank you for doing what you're doing. Yeah, Impact has, has done so much work, you know, in terms of media, like you said, that culture you're talking about. And, you know, we need Islamic organizations in every area. And so uh, media is, um, I mean, you, it, there's no better way to spread an image of a group or a people than through media. It's, 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 the, way, it's the way it's been done. You know, so we have our superstar Sue at MPAC who runs our Hollywood Bureau that really tackles a lot of um, the, the discrepancies and how Muslims are portrayed in media. Um, so she's our, she's going to get so mad at me for giving her a shout out because she's such a humble leader, but she does phenomenal work. And I encourage all of our viewers to check out our MPAC Hollywood Bureau um, for more information because because they are always doing phenomenal work. And again, thank you, Mariam, for joining us. Thank you, for, all our for all of our viewers, if you'd like to catch this um, recorded webinar, head on over to our Facebook page um, where you can find all of our past webinars. Um, and to check out webinars that are upcoming, visit www.mpac.org forward slash webinars. Um, we hope to see you guys soon and safe travels and safe nights for everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Bye. Assalamu alaikum.